thank you, Allison, for taking the time and joining me on the show today. I really appreciate it. Um, you are the president and CEO of the Foresight Institute, which is a nonprofit promoting the development of technology for a positive future, um, focused on things like longevity and AI and, and all sorts of stuff like that. So I think it's a really interesting organization and, and really love the work that you're doing. Um, for those who don't know you or, or don't know Foresight, and everything that you're working on, I think the best place to start would just be to walk through your story and, uh, you know, as early as you're willing to start uh, to where you are today and, and some of the decisions you made along the way. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had a little bit of a chance to actually look, you know, on your blog and, and the podcast and I've seen so many familiar faces. So it's really cool. I think what you're building, like, you know, Nathan, Matt, Alex, Mark, Paul, Danielle, Avichal, like, you know, they they feel extremely foresight aligned. And so, yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, thanks for making it happen. Um, I guess, uh, well, if you really want to start right at the beginning uh, in terms of story, um, I don't think uh, there really was ever a time where, you know, I lived and uh, uh, and and was okay with death. Um, I, I Like, I, I do think it, it's probably my kind of like earliest memory of just, you know, really not not being okay with the fact that uh, things have to come to an end. And, you know, at first, I, I think it's more like a, you know, a wish that you have, but you know, it's kind of impossible. Um, but as a child, you don't really understand why and why not everyone is totally shocked and in arms about it. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it was like really, like really, really unsettling for me in the, you know, my early, I think my early childhood, why not everyone is entirely freaked out at how amazing everything is and that it eventually will come to an end that they won't see their parents anymore that they won't see their loved ones anymore um and just kind of sleepwalking into that and it was like really really difficult um, especially if you're the only one who believes that um you know and yeah <laughs> it's yeah that was weird but um i think you know eventually uh, what was even weirder is that you also kind of understand at some point that this wish for yourself not dying is kind of almost like a puberty version of another kind of even stranger realization which is the fact that civilization as a whole may actually not be secure like when you're a child i think you think that history would just continue you have very little understanding for the fact that you know their emperor has no clothes on and there's really no one in charge there's no adults in the room and eventually you know at any point really civilization could uh, potentially break through an existential risk and i think once you wake up to that you have this kind of second awakening of like wow even if i did make it through um civilization isn't uh is 100% going to be around. And I think those two like kind of realizations were a little bit unsettling to me. And so, you know, obviously the one of civilization surviving, you know, is perhaps a little bit more important because it's kind of the necessary condition for you yourself surviving. Um, so I went on to really focus on that. Um, I went on to do philosophy, mostly just to explore more what this even means. And then, um, you know, focused a lot on existential risks um, and I guess in my like, you know, university career, uh, with a big focus on AI safety and AI ethics and whether or not we can kind of transport human values to um, to machines, um, which was interesting. And I'm, I guess I'm rather skeptical um, just because, you know, once you're in the midst of philosophy, you kind of realize how little humans agree. And like, yeah, it seems really difficult to uh, to get an AI to, uh, to take on anything that humans can't even agree on at the moment. So anyway, uh, when writing my thesis, um, at the time uh, on AI ethics, I found Foresight uh, Institute through research, like random research online. And I was like kind of flabbergasted because there was this one organization that had at that point, I don't know how long it existed at that point. Now it's almost 40 years, but um, that has, had existed for a really long time. And people seemed deeply optimistic about the long-term future while without really being Pollyannish, like it was a bunch of scientists technologists like kind of like just plodding along um you know being signed up to chronic super early on and and just really talking about all the things that you know really kind of like uh, i was dreaming about and uh, with a big focus on molecular nanotechnology longevity and like space exploration and yeah that was it great well uh appreciate the the long story let's start at the beginning um you talked about sort of as long as you can remember I think I heard on another podcast, you said like one of the first thoughts you can remember was like not wanting to die. And like, that's a really, you know, it seems like a, a thought that most people should have. Anyone who appreciates life theoretically wouldn't want to die, but we spend a lot of our lives, you know, sort of just like distracting ourselves with whatever the day-to-day -day is and 
thinking, you know, this is an inevitable thing. This has happened to every human before and it's going to happen to me. And so there's no use in really thinking about it or trying to extend my lifespan or, or anything like that. It just sort of is what it is. Maybe I can exercise and eat well and, and whatever, but anything beyond a hundred is pretty unattainable or maybe 105 or whatever it is. Um, I sort of a similar memory from like when I was really young, just thinking about the concept of death, like there must be some age where you first can even like begin to process like what that could possibly mean. And I just remember this thought of like, it's not just like nothing, like when you're sitting in bed or something like that and there's nothing going on, you close your eyes, you're sleeping or whatever. Like it's, it's not even that it's like nothing to the nothing degree or whatever. Like it's just absolute nothingness. And it's really hard to think about it's it's unimaginable as like a living human we just don't really know what it is but how did you sort of at a very young age do you remember like just sort of navigating that issue obviously it sort of pushed you to study philosophy and and things like that but um does death the thought of death sort of remain top of mind for you as you sort of live your life well i think there's like no part in my life where it's not at least in the back of my mind um you know it's kind of like ultimately prevalent i think you know for people that are like why would we care about this i think tim urban has a bunch of really wonderful um posts on like your life in weeks and you know kind of with the worst thing being that it's not only that you know your life is rather short <laughs> um but also that a subjective time speeds up so you know like you, everyone probably remembers a summer when they were quite young like maybe five or you know when they just went in, were in high school a summer holiday seems like ages Right. Uh, and now, you know, like six weeks or something just fly by in an instance. Um, and so subjective time speeds up. I think it's maybe partly because we lock a lot of the things that are new. And so like that stays in our memory. Well, you know, if you do things again and again, then this kind of like the diff rate is lower. And so it almost logs it as one big memory. Uh, I think, you know, like I'm just hypothesizing here, but like and so it kind of also uh, seems like life your subjective time speeds up over time. So actually life runs faster by you uh, the older you get, which is another very terrifying thing uh, about the whole situation. But I think there's another interesting, like in this, the whole philosophy, you know, bag is kind of like hurling towards you here. I'm very sorry for that, Jake. But I think an interesting point that you made is like, it's not just like nothing. Um, it's really distinctively different to the extent that... Um, there's uh, David Benatar. He's an antinatalist, so he takes the opposite position. He thinks life is terrible, and he actually says that there's a um, asymmetry. It's not uh, never having uh, come into existing uh, into existence like nothing. That is very different to the nothingness after death, because once you're alive, you are losing things by dying. And if you've never existed, then this kind of loss isn't really there. Um, and so it's this loss compartment that, like you know, is really terrifying to me. I think life is amazing. And so kind of, you know, losing that once you have it, uh, it's almost, you know, like you're at this really wonderful party and you have to go home early and you know that everyone else will still be around and they will be, you know, in fact, you have to leave it rather early, you know, before it really starts. Um, and you know that, you know, if things go well, they will be having a really wonderful time and, you know, all kinds of like, you know, really wonderful experiences together and you just have to go. Um, and and so I think this kind of like, you know, really big FOMO also for the f wonderful future that we can build um, if we don't wipe ourselves out uh, is is also a big part of it. But yeah, I mean, you know, much to say about this, but I do think there's that there, yeah, there's a, a lot a lot of philosophical conundrum. I could like name a few others, but I think I'll leave it I'll leave it here. Yeah, no, I'm really interested in the philosophy. I took like a class or two and have read some books, but nothing, I'm sure, to the extent that you have. But I, I think I sort of came to the conclusion that, um, I don't know, philosophy on the one hand seems like sort of the the pinnacle of things that you could sort of spend time thinking about. But at some point I realized like there's all these philosophers and some of them have become more notable than others and they've had these realizations and things, but it's like, I just sort of figured that you don't want to spend your whole life. Like, I certainly think it's worth spending some time on philosophy. I don't mean to suggest otherwise or anything like that. And I think I do. Um, but like, you don't want to spend your whole life thinking about like, what is life, you know? Um, and so I, I don't know, I just sort of landed on that side of the spectrum. But nonetheless, I think that um, and landed on that side of the spectrum so far, at least. But 
I think that different perspectives are super interesting. And I hope I'm like only five or 10% into like my lifelong study of philosophy and, and the various perspectives that people have come to. Um, just out of curiosity, what's this guy you mentioned? It sounds like a, a fairly miserable perspective that this guy maybe just doesn't like life. Like he just thinks it's net bad. Uh, I'm curious if you can sort of uh, explain his perspective a little bit as you understand it. Yeah, he thinks it's probably net bad and that we are biased by the fact that we're already alive at the time when we have to evaluate it. Um, and so we're kind of like, you know, biased because we're already here and kind of like clinging on to it. But he does say that, you know, from a net utilitarian standpoint, uh, it's, it's negative bad for probably most living species. And there's obviously like a few, uh, you know, uh, a few exceptions to it. And so he, I think he isn't arguing for killing everyone off immediately. Um but for phasing out humanity slowly. And, you know, I, I obviously, like, I find myself on the op opposite end of the spectrum. I think life is absolutely wonderful and we should spread it as far and wide as possible. Um, but, you know, I can at least appreciate the asymmetry because I think it's, uh, it is it, it is so great and, and it's very different to never having been born. Um, so, yeah, for what it's worth, I think that's a that's a different. Oh, man, yeah, that is a, uh, a tough perspective to ha have. And I, I think I fall much more on, on your side of things there. Um, but you know, everyone's got a different opinion, so that's fair. Um, I think it was, it was really interesting what you said earlier about sort of the subjectivity of time. It got me thinking, um, you know, you and I, and, and maybe some listeners are, are familiar with the concept that there's at least two different types of aging, right? Like there's chronological, you know, how old are you in years and there's biological, like how old is your actual body? Like, are, are you sort of, do you have the fitness and and organs and mind and, and brain and everything of like a 30 year old or an 80 year old, regardless of your chronological age, you might be sort of really healthy 50 year old who seems more like a 40 year old biologically, or you might be a 50 year old who's like smoked a pack a day for three decades and never works out and eats all fast food. And your body's like, you know, 72 year old biologically. And I don't know exactly how much range there is to these things, but basically you can be a little bit older or a little bit younger biologically than you are chronologically. And I started thinking as you were talking about this sort of subjectivity of time that um, there may almost be like a third age that I haven't really thought about before, which is like sort of your, um, I don't know, excuse this being maybe a bad title, but like perceptual age or something like that, where um, based on sort of like how you live your life, you may have this perception, like it may feel to you that you've lived X number of years and to another person who's the same chronological age or even the same biological age, it might feel to them like they've lived some very different number of years based on what you sort of choose to do with your life. And you mentioned sort of this aspect of, you know, as a kid, every experience is new and um, you're sort of maybe busy sort of logging those new experiences and, and it makes things feel a little bit longer, like the summer when you were five years old. Um, versus sort of getting into a routine and doing the same things over and over again, time seems to fly. And just by the sheer fact that when you're five years old, you've only lived, you know, however many days over five years. And when you're 35 years old, you've lived seven times that the day itself and the year itself seems to, I mean, in my personal experience, like the years seem to just go by like a little bit faster and a little bit faster. And as you get older, that just continues to happen. And, um, I've often wondered, like, uh, you know, in my personal experience, again, doing something that's pretty radically new or just fundamentally different, even if it's just like living in a new place, taking a new job, um, something like that, just doing something very different with your days seems to like extend my sense of like perceptual time, like how fast things are going. And um, I'm curious, like, have you thought about this? Like, obviously, the concept to some degree is something that you had in mind because you, you brought it up. Um, and I'm curious if you've made any sort of like lifestyle choices to extend how long life feels uh, independent of how long life may actually be. Yeah, absolutely. I think definitely high novelty seeking. Um, and yeah, I, I do think though, unfortunately, that's in a contrast to the fact that, you know, another way about white post video shows you how often you will still see your parents. And if you, you know, in our age, in my age anyway, you know, they probably have about, 30 more years to live if everything goes really well and then you can calculate how often you see them per year and then how often you will see them in your life and that number is like excruciatingly low 
And so there is a trade-off between spending time with the people that you love the most that may not be super high novelty seeking and uh, being very high novelty seeking. So <laughs> there's that too, uh, which is a real trade-off. And obviously work and everything else that you know falls into place. I do think like a meta point to this whole thing is what you also touched on, which, you know, I I am really into philosophy. And at the same time, I like it because it makes me feel really secure about the life path that I'm on. Like, I think if you have a really good philosophical education very early on, you just have like this fundament, uh, this basis on which you can, in which you can slot different experiences and different arguments. And you can, you know, kind of like evaluate them like relatively logically, um, you know, depending on how far down the rabbit hole you want to go. And you just have a really good, you know, like at least like a base from which to chart your life. You know, you have good, like, you know, like ethical principles. You have like maybe like some good metaphysical principles. You know a little bit about like what it is, you know, what it means to acquire knowledge. And, and I think that that actually, you know, helped me a lot in just being a little bit more secure about that. No, I actually don't want to die. And, you know, yes, we can actually build a great future rather than it seeming just as like flukes that appear to you <laughs> or something. Like it's good to have that basis. At the same time, you don't, shouldn't get lost in it once you've done like a little bit, I think, on the surface, which is enough for you to be more secure about your life, then I think you can go on and execute. Um, but I think I've, I found that, uh, at least for me, it's been really, really valuable. Yeah, no, that seems super valuable. I think I think of it um, more in terms of like sort of principles, and I don't know how much overlap, if any, there is with with what you just said, but in terms of the philosophy, but like one sort of principle I have is like, I'm obsessed with like not wasting my time and and very importantly like waste of waste of time is def defined like not by what society would call like a waste of time or what others would look at and see as a waste of time but my own definition of like what's a good use of my time and so you know spending time out at dinner with friends and family is like an awesome use of time if I'm doing it like every night you know it has like maybe diminishing returns or whatever but every once in a while however often I can like that quality time with friends and family and people I love is like super valuable to me. Whereas someone might say, Oh, it's a waste of time. Like you should be, you know, working or whatever. And then on the counter side, like some people might look at like work as like a waste of time, like a necessary evil to pay the bills and whatever. But I look at work as like a, a very important and very valuable use of time. Um, you know, depending on, on what I'm working on to some degree, but something like this, like recording podcast episodes, you and I are on here, we're spending, you know, a little under an hour or whatever it is. And hundreds or maybe thousands and, you know, who knows how much in, in the spectrum of time of people will like listen to this conversation. That's just like so amazing to me. Um, and, I'm, you know, obviously we're trying to have a, a thoughtful and, and interesting conversation about things we think are important. And, you know, what else can you really ask for but to like sort of share those ideas and, and get those out there. And I know that's a large part of what you guys are doing at, at Foresight as well. And you guys have a podcast. Um, you guys have a podcast as well. So. Uh, Let's see. Um, transitioning a little bit to, um, and I excuse the rapid transition or whatever, but you talked about like sort of thinking about things on a uh, a personal level as as a you know growing up about death and things like this, and then realizing like as you got older, well, actually, these adults who I always sort of figured had everything figured out and and had everything under control, they don't really know what they're doing any more than I did when I was you know, however many years old uh, as a kid and, uh, the world may actually be sort of at risk. And at the very least, there's a possibility that the world goes in a very bad direction and maybe a possibility that the world goes in a very good direction. Um, so you started thinking more about existential risk and this drove you to study philosophy as well. Um, how did you sort of navigate that issue early on as well? And where have you come to today where I understand you're sort of been able to flip your mindset as like, yes, this is something we need to be concerned about. Yes, this is a very real possibility. But there's also this possibility of existential hope, where the world may end up in a very good place. And whether it ends up in a very bad place or a very good place is not yet decided. And, and we can make a difference in determining which way it heads. Yeah, I think, you know, partly was just, um, I, I think it was, I was really inspired by just foresight take on the future you know like they were kind of you know just accepting the risks like looking at the benefits of the technologies that they're working on and just like plodding along holding both of them in their head and 
And I thought that was like such a kind of sane approach <laughs> compared to most of the doomerism and stuff out there. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, in general, like even in my day-to-day -day work at Foresight, where we mostly like foster early stage technologies and I'm sure we'll get to that, but like every once in a while, you know, I think I just lose track of why I'm doing this work at all. Like why are we supporting all this early stage stuff? Um, and it's easy uh, to, to, to forget why you do that when you're right in the midst, right? And so I think it's really good to sometimes step, step back and ask yourself, why are we doing this? And I think ultimately technologies, you know, are no ends in themselves, but really are tools to be creating worlds that are rather wonderful. And, you know, I think eventually you're asking yourself, like, you know, which future are we actually racing towards? Is it like the existential risk future that, you know, where civilization eventually falls prey to any of the numerous risks that frankly are arising for many of the technologies that civilization is currently building? Or is it more the opposite end where, you know, we use these technologies to reach our cosmic potential, create abundance, morphological freedom, uh, explore the universe, uh, and so forth. Uh, those are like really real possibilities. <laughs> They're both possible right now. I think that's so crazy. We're really like at the cusp of either. I don't think the future is just going to be more of the same. It's really either or, I think. And I think if you ask this question to the average, um, you know, human, I think the answers would be rather bleak uh, to the extent that, you know, especially I think in the next generation, um, which are frankly those people that will soon shape our future, there are like lots of people that really don't have the chance to feel empowered or agential uh, in shaping uh, any bit of it. And I think that's really problematic. I, I, I do think we can't really build what we can't imagine and we need everyone's hands on deck uh, to like go to the better world. And if many of them can't even imagine where to go, like how can we possibly hope to build towards that? Um, I also realize, you know, hope alone is not just a strategy. We can't just like imagine this world into existence. We need serious action. And so a few years back, I read this paper on existential hope by Toby Ord and Owen Cotton Barron, two really wonderful philosophers, um, also pr quite practical oriented. And uh, I got really inspired. And so I set out to collect all the optimistic, future positive resources that I could find, um, fiction, nonfiction, uh, anything else. Um, and crucially, um, I also collected all the organizations, projects, um, individual researchers, people out there that work towards better worlds. Um, and then I basically took all of those into lists um, and gradually curated them um, into different sections and put them on a website called existentialhope.com. And, you know, this is now kind of becoming an onboarding platform for action towards positive futures and, you know, contains podcasts, art exhibits, uh, but really crucially, a bunch of introductory resources uh, to existential risk, existential hope, uh, and then many of the more relevant technology areas, such as biotech, AI, space, etc. And all of these are ordered according to like inspiring pieces, then, you know, pretty hands-on intro material. Um, and then finally, like this action component where, you know, we try to funnel people into different organizations and projects that um, they can join and support once they're onboarded that this feature is important and once they have a rough idea of like what does this field even entail and so you know it's trying to be a little bit more of an onboarding platform for positive futures so that like newbies can get oriented and inspired and different organizations can collaborate uh, and it's kind of like the map that i wish that i could send back to my past self uh, if I, I think if i had had something like that earlier i would have been a little bit more agential much earlier in my life rather than stumbling into this, all of this and having to do a bunch of research um and yeah i mean i encourage uh your listeners to check it out you can submit content so if you have another great piece that should be on there you can submit it you can subscribe to the newsletter we have a monthly podcast that comes out where we interview a scientist on their hopeful vision we then create uh, a story prompt around it and an art piece to like um to exemplify that vision so there's a lot going on <laughs> on this page um but yeah uh, it's, uh, it's definitely one of my favorite um late evening uh late evening activities to add mm -hmm. to this page and um and it's, it, i certainly always leave a little bit more hope inspired uh, when i w was on it than before yeah i first discovered it in, in preparing for this and uh it, it looks really interesting and i see you're sort of taking some some interesting approaches as well to just like getting it out there however you can find people whether it's through podcast or i think you guys are doing like some nfts on some of the art that's associated with some of the different um, you know, postings on the website. And I agree with you, we need, you know, not just movies and not just podcasts, but also, you know, nonfiction books, fiction books, research companies, like you sort of need it all the way across the spectrum to get everyone sort of 
to start to imagine this positive future where currently most of Hollywood, when you're depicting a future and especially one that's highly influenced by technology 30, 40, 50 years forward, it's it's often dystopian. Um, a lot of books are are similar. And it just is this general sense, it seems, that people are not that optimistic about what technology can do for humanity. And uh, I don't think there's any reason why that has, you know, a greater probability of occurring than than a positive future, other than maybe the fact that people sort of have that preloaded in their heads. Um, I think technology, for the most part, it seems to me is, you know, not inherently necessarily good or bad, but can sort of be used for good or for bad or both in the same time. I mean, it goes back to like fire, the original technology, use it to cook, use it to burn down a village. Um, the thing itself isn't necessarily only for one or the other. And I think, you know, one modern example, for example, is like AI. It could be incredibly helpful where, um, you know, it enables people to spend their life working on things that they're passionate about rather than more menial jobs that maybe AI can just handle and Maybe we can have something like universal basic income or people can basically have their basic human needs satisfied by the economy that the AI sort of executes along with, you know, robots and everything like that. Um, or we could have the super evil AI that like makes everything miserable and, you know, regards humanity like an ant and just steps on it and game over. So I think things can, can really go either way. And I agree with you. It's, it's a super interesting time and, um, I think people sort of developing that positive vision and, and a sense of agency is, is really important. Um, when did this ha help me like understand when you started existentialhope.com versus discovering foresight through your thesis and ultimately coming on to foresight and, and joining as uh, president and CEO, how did all of these pieces sort of intermingle and why did foresight in particular, like stand out to you to, uh, to go for it and become, you know, involved and eventually lead. Well, I guess like pretty much the moment I found it online, I just, you know, didn't know that things like this exist. And I immediately wrote them uh, a cold email uh, and said, like, you know, super inspired by their work. Um, and they immediately wrote me back and said, well, why don't you just come over? And I was like, well, where's over? Where are you guys? And they're like, we're in the Bay Area. And I was in at the LSE in London at the time. Um, and so I, I did eventually do that. Uh, and I first started on an unpaid internship, then researcher, then program coordinator, and then, you know, gradually worked my way up to become now president and CEO. And that whole process took like almost 10 years, I think nine, something like that. Also partly because um, visa troubles doing a few administrations <laughs> along the way, or one in particular. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I think, you know, since we were so early in many of the technologies, that are now really gradually blowing up, you know, like molecular nanotechnology, biotechnology, more decentralized approach into AI, um, and so forth. I think now these technologies are really coming online for many people, but, you know, Forza has cared about them now for almost 40 years and has grown like really quirky niche ecosystems around them. So people are like really into the very long term goals. And so, you know, since then we've had like this massive explosion <laughs> in interest um, since that kind of came on and, um, which is really mostly external factors. And Foresight has been a really long existing community for 40 years. We were founded on the book Engines of Creation by Christine Peterson and Eric Drexler, which lays out a really wonderful, fantastic future. And since then, I've been kind of accumulating more of the younger generation. And so, you know, for me, it's this kind of like more generational shift of how do we make, um, you know, Foresight and, and those communities like future ready, uh, given like the kind of wealth of archival knowledge uh, that we have. I think we have one of the earliest websites uh, on the internet, um, which is why we got Fawcett.org, which is <laughs> kind of nice. But yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting because Fawcett was always Bay Area first, which is how I ended up there. But because I'm European and I'm working on it with another, like a lot of my friends now that uh, we kind of started hiring that are also uh, European or like uh, from all over the world, it's really growing into a global community. And we have like our main legs still in San Francisco, but like we now have a really growing community in Europe as well, Berlin, Portugal, London, uh, Paris, uh, and then also all over the place. And so we have monthly meetups in all of these places um, uh, and uh, and have one annual member gathering where we bring the best people from our individual tracks together. And that's in San Francisco, but now it's also at a castle in France. And so they're kind of back to back. 
Um, and uh, there's now also a lot of overspill between these different communities. Um, but yeah, I guess, that, you know, the moral of that is if you ever think that you can't make it to where you want to go, like don't uh, underestimate the um, power that uh, a cold email can have if you frame it well and if it fits. Uh, I think, you know, um, people still read their own personal email. So, um, you know, I'm definitely happy to, uh, you know, also we're trying to make it a little bit easier for people to move to BS um, that would like to and that uh, actually have a place here. Um, and so we're, you know, trying to set up more of a visa structure by which we can also help our fellows get visas and so forth. And so, you know, don't let that stop you if you think it's really hard, uh, but you, that's where you want to go, like, um, keep on pushing, I would say. Um, but yeah, I guess Foresight, you know, has been a really long standing community. And like, since I came on, like, we've really expanded in terms of our programming. I could say a few words about that, unless you want to go somewhere else. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, go for it. I, I was just gonna and maybe I'll just add to that. Like, when I first came across you and uh, sort of realized what you were doing and thought we had a lot of sort of interest in common. Um, I just sort of like assumed that you had founded Foresight, uh, because most young people who are, you know, the head of an organization, they founded it. But it turns out you sort of spent, sounds like almost a decade climbing from intern to eventually running the organization. And maybe as you talk about sort of what you guys have been building lately, um, you could also just talk about like sort of what it's like to take on an organization that, like you said, had like one of the first sites on the internet, um, or at least was started in the 80s. Um, it's just an interesting situation that I, I don't think a lot of young people have really many models to look at for that. Yeah, I do want to say, <laughs> given the people that are our members and supporters and <laughs> the people that we support, they are younger in their minds than I am. I can assure you that. Like, even the ones that have been donating to us now for 40 years, like, I always have my mind blown whenever I, you know, get to speak to them. And so, yeah, it really feels like this very kind of like committed family that has been pushing on these technologies now for so long. Um, and, you know, many of the ones that donated such a long time ago still do and are still actively involved in pushing these technologies forward. Um, I mean, there's so much like gold in our archives. One, for example, there's this talk, Computer Security is the Future of Law at an extropian conference. I think that's almost 30 years ago, where Mark Miller, who's a Foresight Senior Fellow and whom I just authored a book with, and Nick Zabo, you know, one of the obviously creators of smart contracts, debate cryptography, computer security, and smart contracts 30 years ago. And so that's on video. And it's just, you know, there were the first prediction markets, I think, or like, um, I think, well, I don't want to lie, but I think one of the earliest prediction markets really was launched at a Foresight member gathering in 1999 uh, by Robin Hansen, who invented the concept with people literally sending checks to our offices afterwards to bet on different predictions. Uh, we had, you know, in our community, private sea launch attempts, um, you know, like like rocket launch attempts by one of our board members also, I think, over 20 years ago. Um, people were signed up to Cronix 30 years ago, so they were the first really Alco members. And, you know, I'm really learning a lot each day by, you know, diving into our archives and realize, you know, that we, we, like me and the organization, but also all of us as humanity are really standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like now my, my role a little bit to onboard the next generation and uh, and to create a little bit more kind of like intergenerational dialogue, because many of the things that we're building now where we think they're new, they've actually been talked about like 30 years ago and people have tried things and they probably have some knowledge about, you know, why some things didn't work out and they have great ideas. And so, yeah, I guess, you know, since this kind of like longer history and since I took over, we really just expanded some of the, some of the programs that we already had. So we support different technology areas, which is one molecular and non-technology, which is um, really the kind of like foundation of vision on which Foster was founded, um, you know, work on atomically precise manufacturing. Um, then we also support work in biotech and longevity and newer technologies. So it's mostly towards brain computer interfaces. Uh, then we do some decentralized computing as like an kind of almost AI safety strategy where maybe we should have like a more decentralized framework in which different agents can interact rather than one singleton. Um, and we have a space group now as well, which is rather new. So we have like these different groups are like, I guess, what does it mean that we support these areas? It means that we have virtual seminar groups in them with about 250 experts. You can apply to these groups. It's mostly like hand nominated. They meet virtually like once a month and they have in-person workshops per track once a year. And then the best of these tracks get a fellowship um, and they come together for our annual member gathering in this castle in France. And 
um, uh, and and in San Francisco. And so we're really trying to create more of an ecosystem around this. And our hypothesis is that there's a bunch of kind of like technological niches that are currently underfunded um, by more legacy funders because they have different incentives. But if you actually just care about making the technology happen, there's often a better ecosystem way to do that. We have like different types of funders in our ecosystem and they really just like are pretty hands-on and taking stuff on that um, sounds good. And we also have a series of prices, including the Feynman price, which we've been giving out now in nanotech for a long time. We just launched a longevity price, feed it out together. Um, and we have fellowships in these areas that, you know, I briefly mentioned. And actually, our fellowship uh, application for 2023 is now open. So uh, if anyone wants to apply, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a rather boutique or like, you know, hands-on project by which we, we really mostly try to figure out what would most help you and then try to do that. It doesn't come really with any restraints, but yeah, so we do a bunch of stuff and then we recently launched like more course at X projects, which is we're building technology trees right now um, with the idea that to map an actual entire technological area out so that new people can know basically like what's happening in that field and how can they plug in either as a funder or as talent. And that was because, you know, we do so many different technological areas. And I think we are good at the niches and intersections between them. But I get so many emails every day of like people just like, hey, I really want to help this particular part in longevity, but I don't know how. And so rather than me trying to like, you know, make it best educated guess, I, I, it would be nice to just have a map, an over, rough overview of a field, which labs are working on each node, which companies are where, so that you can more directly coordinate people to do different and you know different parts of the te technology tree um and we recently wrote a book on gaming the future which is more of our attempt at creating a more safety paradigm around this tech stack that is informed by cryptography um to really secure our long-term future but yeah so there's a bunch of things going on i think to sum all of that kind of like basket up i think we're really good at pushing on the niches and at the intersections where people aren't really looking at now because the incentives are lacking and where we think we kind of have a comparative advantage. And, you know, crucially, we're a nonprofit. Like, we don't just want to push technologies anywhere. We really want to do more differential technology development for these features to go well. So we have a pretty, you know, uh, direct like goals where we want these technologies to go <laughs> uh, rather than just, like, hurling them along. Yeah, that's kind of, like, the history and current plethora of projects in a nutshell. And, you know, I should say they're all listed on our website rather easily. This is more like a taster, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I think that's all really interesting. And it sounds like you guys are sort of like layering different pieces on as you go. And obviously the, the organization has been around for a long time, but it sounds like you guys are, you know, not short on, on new ideas and, and new ways of sort of building things out. Can you talk a little bit more about the, um, the fellowship in particular? Because I think, you know, even if there's only one person who, who hears it and is interested, um, that not on account of not pe people not being interested, but more on my not having, you know, hundreds of thousands of listeners or anything yet, but there, I think this is the right audience for people who might be interested. And, uh, for those who might be, I think it'd be interesting to, to hear sort of, uh, you know, more details about it and, and what it entails. And it sounds like people can apply today if they want to. Yeah. And uh, the apps are open now and, you know, I just mentioned a few of the technology areas that we're focused on. Basically, in all of these, um, we basically always select a few people that we really, really want to support. Um, and they, you know, may be like, I don't know what the exact ratio right now is. I, I would say maybe it's 40% academics, 60% startups, uh, or like people trying to actively spin out of academia. Um, and then like, you know, maybe under the academics, there's also a few independent researchers. So it's like, it's not either or, you know, you can be researching and seeking philanthropic funding or uh, whatnot, or you can be uh, a founder or like an aspiring founder. Um, the only thing that, you know, we ask from you is that you care about beneficial long-term futures and that you work on something that, you know, is in the span of biotechnology, nanotechnology, decentralized computing, neurotech and space that, um, you know, is, is, is rather ambitious. Um, and so then, you know, what we basically do is we screen um, like different applications. We have an onboarding call. And um, from there, it's really like a kind of like pretty, we work with you hand in hand to connect you to mentors, to record like, you know, different podcasts or like, you know, virtual presentations to invite you to our technical workshops where you meet a bunch of mentors, potential funders and so forth, to invite you to our annual member gathering. 
And that's kind of like the standard template program. And then there's a lot of other things that we just end up doing with them, with our fellows. One of them, for example, is now chairing our entire, uh, or like was chairing last year, our entire molecular machines group. So he literally just took on the track within Foresight. Uh, we just also gave uh, a J1 visa to a really wonderful uh, human, which is like a very specific type of visa that you can give out, um, who joined us and who, you know, really wanted to do a project under the Foresight banner, which was um, hosting a la rather large future oriented conference in the Bay. Um, and so we did that. So, you know, there's definitely a space to also explore potential visas um, and so forth. So there, it's, it's, there's a menu of like, you know, uh, I guess template things we do. And then there's, uh, depending on how much people want to chime in and what people need, it's really like a hand, hand, like a handheld process to figure out how best we can in our position help you guys. And, you know, I think honestly, the best thing is really the network that we can provide, uh, which usually people come out saying that that's, that's the thing that they found most valuable, I guess. Yeah, no, it sounds super interesting. And I hope that uh, maybe there's a couple extra applications that come in from, from this episode. Um, you, you mentioned prizes as well, uh, I think starting with the Feynman prize. And then more recently, I think this was the inaugural, inaugural year for the, uh, for the longevity prize, which I'm particularly interested. Can you talk about like introducing that and uh, how, how the longevity prize went? I think this is the first year, right? Uh, first year, yeah, we just launched it. Uh, and I have to thank big time VitaDAO for that because they got funding for something like a longevity prize and reached out to us, um, you know, as like partners. Um, and so we've just been collaborating on this for the past few months. Um, they got funding through Gitcoin, like uh, Vitalik and a few others uh, matched, like basically were the whales in like a matching pool. And uh, the VitaDAO, like the prize got a, a ton of votes. And so, you know, we kind of went to town and um, I think one thing that this prize is supposed to do is like, it's not like this one large prize at the end of a large tunnel um, that, you know, you have to spend years to work towards, but it's like rather an ecosystem creator of like, you know, you can take them almost as a bunch of different mechanisms and bounties. Um, and so we wa rather want to grow an ecosystem of like different projects working together, collaborating, uh, and this being more like the kind of like initial bit that gets them going. Um, and then it can be taken on by like angel investment or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, we just launched it, I think, last last Tuesday, so a week ago now. And the first prize is on a, a hypothesis prize, where we basically ask people to generate a hypothesis for um, an undervalued area in longevity research. Uh, and this is a one, I think, a one pager only that you send in, <laughs> and you can win up to 20K. Um, you know, partly also because we want to pay researchers for the wonderful ideas that they are continuously producing. Um, and then if we like it, you know, we may do future prizes around it or, you know, try to, um, try to do other bits. But the idea here is really like, let's see how we can use that money. It's 250K in total, thanks to the Methuselah Foundation, who also came in. Um, uh, and it's not a lot of money, you know, it's not going to fund labs for years and years, but it's enough to get people interested uh, and to, you know, write them a little, like have them write a one pager or, you know, contribute a little bit. And so that's the first prize. And then we have a biomarker prize for the upcoming that's under construction. And then the uh, the after that, you know, we're really quite keen on like general prize mechanism design. So we may have prizes where, you know, we have currently a really wonderful jury, which, um, you know, is like, yeah, just a list of a bunch of folks, many uh, or a few of you, few of them have also been on your podcast. And they're like a mix between industry, um, you know, professors, um, you know, more, I guess, you know, like VC folks. And they're like a pretty colorful judging panel. And so we want to set them on different prizes. Maybe they can, you know, each get like a thousand bucks. Um, and so they can kind of like steer the wheel, even if they're very excited about a specific proposal that someone else doesn't want to fund, they can still go ahead and, and give them at least like, you know, that, that initial token of appreciation. And so we're also experimenting a lot with price design mechanisms right now, um, including more quadratic design mechanisms. And so, yeah, if anyone's interested in, Contributing uh, either by, for example, you can up prizes, you can propose specific prizes, um, fund them or have others fund them. It's more like an ecosystem creation really rather than like one large prize uh, that, you know, you kind of like break your back for for years and years and then may end up not winning it. Yeah, no, I, I think that sounds right, especially because, like you said, sort of the, the different mechanisms and ways of organizing a prize can be like they can really impact the outcome. And so you guys got this um good pot of money it sounds like to to begin with and to not just sort of put that all on one prize at the start but 
spread it out and experiment a little bit and see what happens and what works and what doesn't work. Sounds like, um, sounds like the good approach. Um, what's, what's been exciting to you over the last decade or so, um, however long you've been focused on like longevity as one of your, uh, you know, a few main things that, that you think about, um, as a part of foresight and, and otherwise what's been exciting, like, you know, it's one thing for, for you and I, when we were really young to like, think about wanting to live longer and, and things like that. But we just happen to be in this time where, at least from my perspective, like the last couple of decades have introduced this progress in this sort of area of like thinking, taking an engineering perspective to how aging works and considering the possibility that it may actually be realistic and possible to slow aging, if not maybe even reverse it. And, um, you know, obviously if you can have any impact on aging, a 10% slowing of aging or something like that. That's, you know, plus eight years on life theoretically, whereas some of these major diseases, like one of the things I think about all the time is like, um, I'd read somewhere basically, like if you were to cure cancer overall, obviously cancer is a terrible thing and, and kills lots of people and, you know, including like my grandparents and, and things like that, like not, not to dumb that down at all, but, um, it's a very complex issue. And even if we solved it entirely sort of the next thing will get that person who otherwise would have died from cancer so heart disease or whatever it might be. Um, whereas aging, if you just sort of like expand the whole thing, the whole health span 10% by having a 10% impact on slowing aging, that's like a really exciting thing to me. And it's, it's super underfunded. Um, it's like a ridiculous percentage of the amount of funding from like DNA and IH goes to aging and, and research around it. But I think over the last 10 to 20 years, people have started to actually you know, more people are working on it, slightly more people are funding it, more people are paying attention to it and talking about it and building companies working on it. And those companies are getting founded. So it really feels like there's some momentum to me. And I'm curious your perspective on that as well. Um, having watched things develop over the last, you know, however long it's been. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like there's much more, like much more momentum around it now than there was like even six years ago when we had workshops around it. And it was like, all still pretty, are very rough um and definitely earlier than that too and i almost want to take a contrarian approach like i know that you know there's a ton of really wonderful projects that are currently pressing as hard as they can on longevity and there's a lot more funding than there used to be nevertheless definitely not enough um but i think like it's worth considering that we won't make it there um especially our parents not um and so you know one area that you know, I usually try to focus on this just because if you can only remember one that's sad is cryonics. And, you know, I I think keeping in term, in, with foresight spirit of like always being like a little bit at the edges and the fringes still, uh, cryonics is something where even many people in longevity haven't signed up yet because it's one very painful mental shift to realize that, you know, death is not great. And then it's another one realizing that maybe the longevity tools that we're working on won't get us there in time. That's another really painful one. So at that point, you know you don't want to die, but you also know you won't make it. Um, and so and 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 so that's the shift that you had to do for cryonics. And so there's a few really good cryonics like organizations and companies out there. Uh, people always think it's super expensive. It really isn't. Um, you know, I have a nonprofit salary, and I uh, I can do that through my life insurance. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's worth at least going on these websites, maybe even reading the Tim uh, Urban Wade by Y post or go on existentialhope.com where basically all, all the resources that I mentioned throughout this podcast are usually on existentialhope.com. That's kind of my exo brain. Um, but yeah, but like read up on it, decide whether you think it's a, uh, it's a bet worth taking. Chances are really small right now that any of this is going to work because we're just not there yet. But, you know, a, a small chance is better than like zero chance of surviving once you're dead underground or, or cremated or whatever uh, and so yeah I, I would think pretty bullish on cryonics not because I think it's really far already but just because I think that uh, we need to uh, yeah we need to kind of like save our bases here yeah it's interesting I've I've talked about it with a couple of people now on the podcast and uh, I haven't yet done it myself but frankly I just haven't spent the time sort of looking into the various providers and things. And I sort of did have that assumption that it was like really expensive and I could just do it later. Um, but it's probably worth spending you can't. some time on. Later life insurance is more expensive. Cryocrastination is very expensive because later on your life insurance will go up. True. <laughs> no. 
True. Yeah, no, I, I think I need to uh, up my sense of urgency a little bit and uh, also talk to my parents about it and, and things like that. Um, it's a good it's a good backup plan. And uh, if nothing else, maybe you can uh, have your last days with with a little bit more hope. Um, and that's, you know, there's something worthwhile there as well, I think. Uh, last question, because I, I know we're coming up on time, but um, you mentioned how, you know, there's like a 30 year old video people talking about crypto. I think you said Nick Zabo talking about crypto and prediction markets all the way back then. Like people think 2010, 2011 is early for crypto, but there was, there was crypto before Bitcoin. And uh, it sounds like a lot of that was being discussed at the Foresight Institute. Uh, you also talked about like people trying to do rocket launches and um, signing up for cryonics all the way back then. I'm curious if there's anything that you're seeing going on in the community today um, that sort of gives you the idea that maybe 30 years from now, we might look back and be like, wow, you know, these people at the Foresight Institute in the community, there's a few people that sort of like, even we within the community thought we were being like a little bit crazy. And, and they actually turned out to be doing something that now is, is much less crazy in, in 2050 or whatever it is. Is there anything that, that strikes you or it, it might be really hard to like foresee that uh, even at the Foresight Institute, but uh, I'm curious if there's anything that sort of sticks out as, as interesting and and not very often talked about um, today. Well, this is going to sound really lame, but I think it's still crypto, and I think that it's cryptography and computer security in the sense that, you know, I I, I feel I feel like we're just getting our feet wet in realizing what's possible with these technologies. And uh, Christine Peterson, the founder of Foresight, Mark Miller, you know, the early cypherpunk that I that gave this talk, uh, that is I think still one of the most inspirational talks I've ever watched. Computer security is the future of law. The two of them and me wrote a book called Gaming the Future, where we basically discuss um, crypt cryptography and security technologies and their long-term implications, where they can get us. And so first we go through how human cooperation evolved and how that's been really nice with the technologies that we have, including like contracts. <laughs> and then we go through how can smart contracts update on those, for example, with things like spit contracts that are things like that are half automated and half have a human in the loop. We can use them to solve collective action problems, for example, with things like assurance contracts, where they function a bit like Kickstarter, but you actually get a premium if you funded something early and the threshold isn't reached. So to kind of incentivize people to be early for collective action problem solving. Um, and so we discuss a few of those, like basically how do crypto technologies in the next five years help us to cooperate better? And then crucially, we take it two steps further. The first one is we apply them to existential risks. So I think currently, there's a bunch of risks that we see approaching uh, and you know we think that a smaller number of people can kill, can kill a larger number and the main hammer that we have to go against that is regulation and the government but actually crypto technologies especially like decentralized forms uh, of you know potentially like private preserving monitoring uh, can really get us kind of like the best of both worlds we can avoid perhaps some of the technological risk without falling into totalitarian dictatorship and then the third step that we make is we can use those technologies to cooperate with artificial intelligences as well. So we already have an economy that we're building out in these systems right now. This economy crucially is integratable with AIs because, you know, we can <laughs> trade with them with uh, currencies and so forth. We can incentivize AI DAOs, whatever. Eventually, you may not know who you cooperate with. There's different things called, you know, like privacy preserving machine learning that we can eventually maybe have in a crypto native way. So we're just exploring the more longer term implications of that. And yeah, the book's called Game of the Future. It's currently a Substack book. And it's going to come out as a like self-published uh, bit uh, fairly soon, uh, which is a little bit more of a, it, it, it's rather dense, uh, but I think it's worth it for those people at least being interested in what these technologies can mean for the long-term future. Because I think it's ultimately not just one of many technologies, but it's kind of like rebuilding the entire stack uh, with which we then build technologies and prevent the risks. Great. So uh, the book is called Gaming the Future. I think you previously had co-authored a book called Super Intelligence uh, for anyone who wants to go check those out. And the video, which I've noted to check out myself, is called um, Computer Security is the Future of Law, I believe. Uh, so I'm going to look that up and, and check that out to hear you say it's one of the most inspirational videos you've seen. Uh, I'll take that and, and I'll go, you know, that's enough for me to, to go and spend the time to check it out. So uh, anyway, I, I know we're up on time, but uh, Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Allison, for for coming on and, and taking the time and, and sharing with everyone. And I think people are going to really enjoy this one. Uh, where else can people go to uh, to follow you and, and Foresight and, and everything that you guys are doing uh, moving forward? 
for if you're into existential hope, then it's existentialhope.com. And if you're into any of the foresight bits that I mentioned, it's foresight.org. And there you have links to the fellowship. Um, they have links to different prizes. We have our annual member gathering coming up. We have a crypto security AI workshop in October. All of those have application forms. And just to keeping up to date, I guess you can apply to our Discord on that page, or you can just follow uh, Foresight in, on Twitter or Alison D Man, which is me uh, on Twitter. And yeah, I just thank you so much. Uh, you've been a really wonderful uh, just you know discussion partner. And um, yeah, I think uh, I really like the way your brain works and um, the way that you're in conversation. And thanks a lot for having me on. Mm-hmm.